This is the Mosh Pit Backstage Podcast for punk, metal and rock interviews and segments. and you're listening to Mosh Pit on Zen. Xavier is a guitarist of Melbourne band Pagan who are releasing their debut album Black Wash on July 6th. They will be touring Australia in August playing at the Tote on the 24th. Xavier, thank you so much for talking to me. No worries, man. It's good to be here. Yeah, now we talked a little while back a few months ago um, and yep. one of the questions that I didn't kind of get to ask um, sort of a more broad question is how did the, how did the band start? When, when, when did you guys form a band? Yeah, look, thinking back, man, I guess, like, me, Matt, and Dan, like, we also played in um, other bands at the time that were kind of, I guess you could bluntly say, on the way out. And then um, Dan was always like, you know, one day we're going to start a band with Nikki, and it's going to be great, and she's going to sing, and it's going to be a mix of Cabela Tech, like, Fugazi or something. And it was just like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, and, like, thinking it's going to be a lot of work to actually start up. But then sort of push came to shove and we sort of just had a few jams and it sort of didn't really sound like anything that we were kind of into at first and uh, we kind of just took it really easy and practiced maybe once a month if that and then eventually a sound just sort of starting to form and we got a bit more comfortable with like playing with each other and you know little mannerisms and things and then I guess before you know we had two or three songs down and we started to sort of take it a bit more serious. Oh, really, really cool. Now the album Blackwash... Um, we, it's interesting because we sort of discussed this at the very tail end of our interview a few months ago and you mentioned like, hey, we're actually working on an album, like it's, it's done basically and we're going to release it soon. I'm like, all right, let's have a chat about it. So this is that yep. chat. Now, yep. talk a little bit about, re- refresh us, how did that album come to be? Um, okay, so in, in, like initially we never actually wanted to do an album. Uh, we never was on the, on the cars pretty much. We are... Uh, we are constantly releasing singles. Um, we were getting, like, artwork done for every single, and we were just popping them out on Bandcamp. It was just like, hey, new song out, here you go. Um, Triple J on Earth would run it. Um, it would be around a sort of other media on the net. But besides that, it was kind of just every couple of months we just put something out. And, you know, we were kind of getting some pretty decent shows offers from that and then get another batch of singles, and we recorded sort of four at a time. And then we released Imitate Me, one of them, and then we were sort of... A- they were like, hey, you know, why don't you guys just, you know, come uh, come on with us and do an album? And we were just like, what? Okay, well, I guess it wasn't really in the plans. And we already had all these songs re-recorded, ready to go, um, with like a plan of a rollout. So basically you put all those on the back burner, um, never released them, so no one's heard them. And we redid them again for the album. So we sort of, you know, got everything together, pulled our resources and pulled a bunch of other songs up. And then that's kind of how the the album came about. Mm, that's really interesting. What was it like re-recording the songs? Did, were there things you were focusing on improving? Yeah. What, what, what was that like? Absolutely, because, like, I guess you, when you, we first recorded them, like, we had a mix and mastered and everything. Like, the, the, the actual quality was awesome. I was just listening to them after, you know, a couple of months later, you could be like, oh, it could be cool if we had another guitar do this here or had, like, another part here or, like, did an overdub on a vocal here or something. So it was kind of cool to go in and, like, essentially have remaster a couple of old songs that no one had even sort of heard. So that was cool. Mm, that is really cool. Um, Blackwash, what, what does the album title mean? Yeah, it's... I guess it refers to more sort of darker times, if if if, if anything. I mean, Nikki sort of, you know, being the voice of the band, she writes all the lyrics, and whereas us boys sort of just... We come up with the music side of things, but um, yeah, a, a, a lot of it is coming out of some darker times and dealing with a lot of um, emotional sort of you know wreckage and stuff like that. So I just think it's a simple title, and we actually had it named as one of our songs for a long time, and then we ended up making that a B-side on the uh, Death Before Disco single, and we titled that Church of the Blackwash, so we could just call the album Blackwash to be much more simpler. Mm, no, that's, that, that's really good. Um, you guys as a band, do you have a process for writing new music? Yeah, it's like um, we always get, I guess like me and Dan, like we'll sort of sit down, Dan plays bass, and we'll sit in like separate rooms, you know, our place, his place, whatever, and 
we'll just sort of come up with like a little skeleton. Like we don't sort of delve too deeply in because it is very much a everyone needs to be on board with the sound and the vibe and everything. And if someone sort of isn't into something, we're totally into you know revamping it and making sure it is something that everyone does get into. So we don't spend too much time writing entire songs. Um, it'll be just coming coming to the group out of practice space with a bare skeleton, you know, maybe an intro, a riff, a pre-chorus, a chorus even. And then if it starts gelling and the process is working, everyone's kind of getting into it, then, yeah, we'll spend maybe two or three practices, like, fleshing it out and putting it all together. But, like, we, like I hear that a lot of bands, like, recording stuff at home by themselves, and they'll send it to other guys in the band, they'll record their parts, and then it all just gets done through the internet almost. But, I don't know, it's just always been... Take a little bit of a uh, take a like a tiny bite out of something, and then bring it to practice, and then make it into a full meal sort of thing. Mm, that's interesting. So at at the practice, let's say you've got you uh, you and Dan have made a skeleton of the song. You brought it to practice. What 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 would you do? You play it, and you get a uh, drummer to play along. You get Nikki to sing along. How, how does that next step take place? Yeah, yeah. I guess so. Um, I guess. Drums and guitar, I mean, sorry, uh, bass and guitar, they can kind of follow each other and then we sort of build meatier parts around those a bit later, but we definitely do throw Matt in the deep end a little bit because he has to sort of come up with something that's pretty sort of, I guess, vibrant and catchy straight away on the drums. And um, Drums are very overlooked, I think, in, 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 in most bands. And um, I remember an old friend of mine I used to work with, uh, Cameron Baines, who, who's playing, who does play in Body Jar, always told me that the most important thing in a band is the drums and the vocals. So um, it's always been a, a bit of an emphasis, you know, to make the drums sort of stand out, I guess, with Pagan. And at first, you know, if you're just, like, listening to a song in passing, it's kind of like, yeah, it's cool, but, I mean, Matt is an amazing drummer and I've been playing with him for a very long time. And I can definitely throw that guy into the deep end and he can come up with some really fun stuff straight away. And obviously he'll, you know, change things along the way and make things a bit more media, but... Um, that's how the, the, the drums sort of come about it. And as far as Nikki, like, I think she'll want to get the groove of the song for a while. Um, there are practices where, like, we'll just go as a, a bit, like, just as the boys just to write some music. And then we send her a couple of recordings, say, hey, do you like this? Do you like this? Or just, like, you know, sort of crappy ones off our phones. And then she'll, like, sort of sit and write some um, lyrics in her room or she'll come to the next practice and have a notepad out and just sort of get in the spirit and, like, sort of get into our own mind with everything and the lyrics just start rolling out that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, really organic. It's really cool. Um, with, with the new album, and maybe it's something that I've just picked up and it's not actually a thing, but is, is there a presence of a bit more backing vocals in this new one? Yep, you're absolutely right, man. Like, we sort of... Well, like, you, like we sort of said, like, we recorded some stuff and then we sort of put that to rest to redo it all again for the album and it was a good time to think like well what's you know we all play instrument in this band but like what's what's our role and I think Dan in particular was kind of like I really want to move away from being just screaming in the background or yelling I actually want to maybe do some singing parts and you know we're all down with that it's like try something a little bit different um so yeah he sort of went away and sort of wrote a few parts for that uh sort of more sort of singy and uh, melody-driven sort of vocals. Even I did to a point, but a lot of it didn't sort of work out. I uh, just think the guitar and it was a little bit too hectic to sing and play at the same time, and it just worked out better just ditching the vocals and having um, just guitars. But yeah, you picked up on that 100%, man. So that's um, something that's good to hear, actually. <laughs> a feather in my cap. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> um, now, one of the, the focus songs that's been released so far... Um, it's funny, it's funny that we talk about it. it's like um, you know the album is sort of this future thing but it's like it's two days away that's kind of crazy um, but anyway uh, Death Before Disco one of the sort of yep. uh, first songs released yep um, at what stage do you guys realise or whoever realised that this this is the song that we want to put out first this is a really great song that we want to promote the, promote the album when, when does that happen and how does that happen yeah, well, like we was sort of mentioning before as well, a, a whole bunch of these songs on Blackwash are kind of, I mean, for us, they were kind of considered older because we were re-recording them. So there was a handful of new ones, and we wanted it to be something that we were excited about to put out. And that song in particular, I remember sitting there and talking with everyone, and Nikki and Dan were all saying, like, 
it just has everything. Like, it sort of has, like, a, a rocky sort of intro. There's disco beats in it, and there's a blast beat in it, and there's a heavier breakdown in it as well. Um, and there's more of a melodic kind of chorus with it. So it's, it's, I never even saw it until they mentioned it. And I was like, you know what, you're absolutely right. Like, it has everything. It's probably a great song to sort of debut um, a single with. So it was just an, an easy pick for that one. So and it was, it's a fun one to play. Like, we, we only sort of started playing it live even a few months ago when the song dropped. And um, we were rusty definitely at first. We've done it a few times now, and it is, it is heaps of fun to play. No, it was really cool. Um, the opening and closing tracks, they're, they're yep. interesting because they um, uh, translate. It's the Evil Eye opens, Evil Eye closes. Really cool. Um, Correct. How, how did those two come about? And was there sort of a thought early on that you wanted some sort of opening and closing? Uh, how, how did this all work? Um, I remember I was just playing around in my living room and sort of came up with that sort of intro riff, and I remember just sort of sending it to Dan, and he was just like, this is going to be the last song. And it was just 15 seconds of a guitar riff, nothing else. So I was like, okay, well, at least he likes it, so I could bring it to practice now and show the rest. And then I think that outro song itself, Evil Eye Closes, essentially just came together, like, very naturally. And I was just like, wow, this is super powerful. And um, as far as making an intro as well, I was kind of like, do we want it to be the first song? Are you sure you want it to be the last song? And then we sort of said, why don't we do it as a both? And then we were just like, you know what, that's probably going to sound pretty awesome. So um, we sort of split the intro and like made a sort of intro sort of style of it with very similar guitars and you know, bass sounds and everything. And then you know, Nikki went away and did her vocals and we actually hadn't heard any of the vocals until she sort of stepped into the booth to do them. And I think I was just there at the time. The other boys were maybe at work. And I was basically giving them, like, live updates, like, through Facebook Messenger, like, how it was all going. And then when she started singing and then everything was just coming together and the dynamics of it all, we were just, like, I was just frozen. I was like, man, this is going to be my favourite song to listen to, like, for sure. Mm, So I think everyone just sort of came through. And, yeah, it's just... Yeah, super emotional, very strong, very powerful, and yeah, I'm looking forward to getting that out there and seeing what other people think too. So. Yeah, it's definitely the best way to open and close. Now that it's you know the the eve of the eve of the release of the album, <coughs> how, how do you feel about the decision to uh, release these as a, a block? How, how do you feel about that? Like as in... Um, like really, really release the songs as an album. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Like, it's, um, I haven't really experienced this before, like, playing in other bands, but it's, when you, when you record something, it, it's honestly been over seven months now until it, we've sort of finished with it all, and it's just, you know, I've been itching to sort of show people, like, hey, this is, this is what I was stressing about last Christmas, and, like, the stuff that I was telling you I had to spend some time and write some guitar for, and, um, I kind of want to show that product off a little bit because I'm super proud of it. And um, we've, you know, come a long way in the last few years and we're all a tight-knit group of people and it's just really nice to have something physical out there just to show and be like, I'm really proud of this um, and I hope other people are too. So there's a part of me that's a little bit nervous about it all, but there's a part of me that's just like, be proud of this, mate. Like, you've you've done really well and everyone has and um, just got to ride it from here and great times ahead. Mm, well, I'm fortunate enough to have uh, uh, been able to listen to the whole thing. I can definitely agree with all those. That oh, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome, though. You should be very proud. Now, the tour, this yep. is going to be your first headline tour, touring a bunch of cities in Oz. Yeah. How, how are you feeling yeah. about that? Yeah, it's pretty daunting, man. Like, we were, we were very stressed when we even had, like, the single launch of the social club um, sort of a couple months ago. Um, You know, you constantly get that email that shows you how many tickets have sold sort of every week, and you kind of just stress out about that a little bit. Then you're picturing the room and, you know, people dressed in all white and just like, is it going to be full? Are we going to feel silly? Like, is everyone going to have a good time? And, you know, it's just those sort of thoughts going through your head. And I think that was was our second ever headlining show. We'd done one prior to that in Brisbane. And so now to have, like, kind of five of them in a month, um, basically stacked. It's just like, okay, we're going to go through that feeling all again, but at least 
we'll have an album out at that point and it's something to sort of show off and maybe that'll calm our nerves a little bit. So, yeah, it is it is daunting and um, I think we're just going to have to roll with the punches and see how we go with it all. Mm-hmm, definitely. With regards to playing on stage, this is kind of a weird question that I ask most people that I talk yeah. to about a live show. When you're on stage, what what is it you're trying to do? Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, I, I, I guess you're... Well, I mean, you, you're trying to provide a performance that's different from the band that's just been on or maybe different from what's coming up next or from what someone's seen last week. Um, you want to, like, have someone in the crowd turn to their friend and be like, man, this is cool, I haven't seen anything like this before or it's been a while since I've seen a band that's sort of given me shivers or anything like that, so... I guess those sort of feelings are definitely um, something that you want to sort of hopefully um, convey out. But for me personally, I'm just making sure I'm playing the right stuff and I do get quite nervous as well um, playing live and it isn't until like maybe two or three songs and you start to sort of loosen up and then the fun sort of takes over a little bit more and then it all just starts rolling a bit smoother. So... um, I guess it's just to show people maybe something that they're not used to, and you know maybe there's a he- they've seen a heavy band that's doing some weird disco beats and some you know something a little bit more party, and that's cool, you know. So mm, mm, definitely, uh, a couple last questions about you personally. Yep. How do you get into heavy music? Yeah, I guess like straight away from sort of high school, um, kind of went through the whole punk rock sort of pop punk phase, and then discovered bands like I think back then it would have been maybe Thrice possibly or even um, bands like Finch that were maybe coming up that were a little bit sort of on the heavier side but still had a kind of melodic sort of um, sense to them and then I progressing into different bands from that but oddly enough like I was never really a big like fan of real heavy music Um, even to this day it's all more sort of, you know, rock and uh, I guess like nice and melodic, pretty sort of guitar parts in songs and even like a lot of classical stuff too. So um, I guess that could be a good thing, like being a heavy band where, I mean, certain instruments aren't inspired by heavy bands. But I think when I was younger and like learning those songs by bands like Thrice, for example, you're hands and your fingers learn chords that will always stick with you so pretty grateful for that mm-hmm. when did you start playing guitar um all right so we're in grade five so i guess that's uh, what 10 years old maybe 11 and the, i had to learn um i think it was nutbush and breakfast at tiffany's for the primary school band and wrapping my head around those bar chords um, was a real struggle. But my dad had always played guitar, and there was always acoustics floating around the house. So it was not until sort of 10 years old that I actually picked one up properly and, you know, learned a song or two. Mm. Uh, and final question. Uh, do you, I, I know this can be very difficult on the spot, uh, but do you have yeah. any favourite bands or albums? Uh, yeah, look... Um, I mean, just recently, like, High Tension just released Purge, and it is amazing. Um, Luca Brasi from Tasmania, they just released Stay, and I've been listening to that consistently at home and at work. And even slowly, slowly with St. Leonard, is just... Um, I caught those guys at their um, album launch in Melbourne, me and Dan went, and I'd never heard a song before, and it blew me away. And, um, yeah, I guess those sort of three bands I guess they're all Aussie bands too when you think about it so um, yeah they're probably what I've been listening to consistently in the last you know two three weeks oh, that's really cool uh, Pagan will be releasing their debut album on July 6th Blackwash and they'll be touring Australia in August playing at the Tote on the 24th Xavier thank you so much for joining me thanks for having me thank you thank you Thanks for listening to the Mosh Pit Backstage Podcast. You can subscribe to us on iTunes and Omni. To find out more about the show, go to www.syn.org.au slash moshpit. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash moshpitonsyn and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at moshpitsyn.
The regular Mosh Pit radio show broadcasts punk, rock and metal tunes and interviews every Thursday nights on Sin 9.7 on FM and digital radios. Listeners outside of Melbourne, Australia can stream Sin 9.7 online at www.syn.org.au. Thanks to Vintage Ruin for the music. Hi, this is Samantha from Flash Gun Apocalypse. Hi, I'm Enid from Girls Go. I am Phoebe Pinnock from Heaven the Axe. Hey, this is Gary Olmy of the Mystics. Hey, this is Kat Sproul from Horizon's Edge, and you're listening to the Mosh Pit on Sin FM. Hi, this is Aina from Leopard. Hi, I'm Virginia Lilly from the band Lilly. This is Raoul from 1349. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ali from Eberhead. Hey everybody, this is Charlie Benante with Anthrax, and you are listening to the Mosh Pit on Sims.